You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program where we break down all the exciting action going on in the world of crypto derivatives. So, of course, Bitcoin, also maybe a little bit of ETH, some Litecoin, XRP, you never know what's going to make it on to the show. That's why you have to tune in. we kicking it off the new year, looking for a new decade, actually. Hard, hard to say that with a straight face, yet here we are, a new decade of the crypto rundown took a couple weeks off at the end of the year for all that fun holiday goodness and now we're back and we're back in force so look forward to some fun crypto rundowns hitting your podcast machine of choice in the coming weeks and indeed months and joining me of course to help me break down all the fun stuff going on in the world of crypto it seemed appropriate to bring him back here at the start of this new year indeed this new decade our old friend, Mr. Bill Ulaveri, the principal over there at Seneca Capital Management, when he's not hanging his hat over there at Athena Trade during the day. Mr. Bill, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown and Happy New Year slash New Decade to you, sir. And also with you. Thank you for having me on today. It's always great to be with you, Mark. Well, it's an appropriate time to have you on, Bill, because we're looking back and we're looking ahead. It's going to be a fun one. So without further ado, let's dive right on into the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is going on and what was going on indeed in 2019 in the world's most popular Crypto slash digital asset. Yes, of course, talking Bitcoin. We'll talk the spot here, but we'll look at the options, the volatility, the volume, the futures, all that good stuff going on out there as well. What an interesting year it was, not just for this show, which is celebrating its one-year anniversary as well. We launched this pretty much exactly a year ago as well. So happy anniversary. A little tip of the cap to us here on the program. We were waiting for everyone in the industry to kind of get their acting gear and launch crypto options and... Finally, we could wait no longer, so we launched this show last January, and oh, what a tumultuous year it was, and now here we are coming into the new year. Looks like we finally got some options on the horizon from CME, some stuff already listed over there, and back to land, and some other fun stuff to parse as well. And coming into the start of the new year here, we're seeing a bit of a lift. You know, one of the the narratives we saw unfolding in the crypto marketplace over the course of last year is, you know, what really is... This crypto thing, in particular Bitcoin, what is it? What purpose does it serve? 
in the broad marketplace. Is it indeed, as some have termed it, is it this uh, flight to digital quality? Is it a digital goal? Does it serve in that same sort of use case? Do you, when your things are crazy in the world, are you going to fly to crypto just like you're flying to gold and other physical metals like that? Or is it this other completely non-correlated asset that completely does its own thing? And it seems like for the lion's share of the year, it leaned more towards the latter. But there were some interesting moments where it kind of leaned like the former, like a little bit of flight to quality was in store. That may seem to be what we have cooking here to start the new year as well, because coming into the new year, we're seeing uh, Bitcoin back up. It's been a little while, so we can say that on the show. And back up pretty strong. Coming into showtime was up about 625 handles from where we were on our last show. We closed last show right around 6,900, and it was at about 75 and a quarter. Now it's at a closing in at 75 and a half as we're kicking off the show here. It's actually up about 600. And 50 points from where it was this time last show. Remember, that was a couple of weeks ago, so in towards the middle of December. And a lot of that being driven, it seems like, by the saber rattling going on between between the U.S. and Iran. This back and forth, Sturm and Drang assassination volatility that a lot of people thought would maybe drive a lot more vol and a lot more action in the, in the broad market. It hasn't really delivered on either of those, but it does seem to perhaps be delivering... On the Bitcoin front, Bill, is that your takeaway as well? Is you think that's what's really driving this green start to the year here? Is is this saber rattling between us and Iran? Or you think something else is at play here, sir? Um, you know, Mark, it always seems uh, historically that the cryptocurrencies kind of in general will make their lows or they'll make a high uh, in the fall, uh, and then we you know kind of put in the low in the springtime right of the of the calendar year. And I think that's what we're doing here. I mean, if you look at a point and figure chart of the uh, of Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrencies, at least from my perspective, we're probably putting in like a head and shoulders kind of bottom. Um, we have the we have the Bitcoin having you know coming up next year. We have always if if Bitcoin is really going to be a digital gold, it's going to be a flight to quality asset, a store of value, which it certainly seems to be. Um, getting taking more and more of that personality rather than a medium of exchange. I think we're going to see more and more people buy Bitcoin when events like this happen. And I'm not quite so sure it's the Iranian uh, situation, although there's probably a little bit of it. Again, we're dealing with $17 trillion of negative interest rate bonds around the world. And there's a lot more scarier things out there, in my opinion, than, than what happened uh, between the U.S. and Iran recently. That's true. There are a lot of spooky things lurking out there in the ether of the marketplace. Since you mentioned the technical levels, our friends over there at CryptoPatterns.net putting up some interesting technical analysis of all things Bitcoin. You can read the full things for yourself over there at TheOptionsInsider.com. I'll give you just the, the Cliff's Notes version here saying, of course, when the time they wrote this, I think it was about a couple day or so ago, uh, Bitcoin was hovering around that $7,000 range, obviously a little bit north of that. Uh, now, so they're looking at some of their their price action as a result, and they they think for their analysis, uh, they think it's increasingly important to see Bitcoin continue resuming this bullish path. Otherwise, they think the bears are going to take over, and seeing perhaps prices of five thousand and even three thousand come back into play, that would be that would be fairly dire. That would erase pretty much all of all of twenty nineteen uh, from that perspective. As of the time when they wrote this, they said the bullish signs would be closing for the week. Above 7,053, and also volume uh, continuing higher on, on the move back up above 7,000. We're obviously north of 7,000 now. Question whether we'll, we'll stay close above this level, but a good start to the week at the very least. They also point out some red flags. They had current drop below the levels that they were at around 7,000 down to about 6,400. That would be that would be spooky to them. I think that would probably indicate the next level would be a fast drop down to the supports at around 5,000. So that would be pretty dire for Bitcoin bulls out there. So just some interesting nuggets. For those of you who like technicals out there in crypto land, again, check out the whole thing for yourselves or just get on over to CryptoPatterns.net. They have it there as well. Sticking so to looking at how things have performed, let's look at the year that's been out here in the world's leading Crypto market, which is, of course, Bitcoin. It was a crazy year, 2019. Remember when we started this show, it was very much an open question what the future of this product was going to be. It was at the tail end of the crypto winter. Uh, We kicked off the year right around 3,700, so 3,715 is where Bitcoin kind of opened 
on the year. And then we saw some interesting price action over the subsequent six months as we saw the massive rally up to over – actually, at about 13000 That was in the first six months of the year. So in the first six months, Bitcoin was up nearly 300%. Uh, so a huge, huge move. We saw some big drops throughout the year. We saw the big drop on July 11th, about 10% drop. That was the biggest 24-hour loss over the course of the year. That was, of course, at the time when uh, everyone in Congress seems like they were just piling on to Libra. <laughs> Facebook's, of course, proposed cryptocurrency, and that really – really spooked a lot of people in the crypto space. And as a result, we saw a huge drubbing in the 24-hour period up there. And we ended up seeing Bitcoin end the year a little bit north of the 7,000 level, about 71, almost 7,180 or so, 7,179 or so. That would put it up about 93% on the year. So still a good year, I think, for any major asset. They'll take that, certainly, uh, but still not quite the 3x move we had seen at one point uh, throughout the year. Bill, as you're looking back, on the year that was Bitcoin in 2019, what for you really stood out? Was it some of the price action? Was it some other developments you saw? What really resonated for you as you look back on 2019 from a Bitcoin perspective, sir? You know, Mark, I don't really focus that much on the small or even intermediate fluctuations in Bitcoin because either you believe in the technology, you believe in it as a store of value. And so for me, Bitcoin at 7200 or 6800 personally is it doesn't matter. It's either going to be 7000 or 250000 a token in the next 10 years, right? Somewhere in between. Uh, but for me, I think this, this, this tug of war, this struggle between the world of decentralized platforms and the world that you and I would call as regulated institutional platforms. So the good thing is we see, you know, Fidelity, Bact, uh, Aris X Exchange, CBOE, CME Group, JP Morgan, right, with their their – their discussion about creating a their own J.P. Morgan token, which will, in essence, allow them to in, internalize trillions of dollars on a daily basis using a J.P. Morgan token rather than, say, clearing or wiring or settling international payments uh, over the course of a few days or a few weeks. So that, to me, was super, super exciting. And the Facebook uh, Libra token, you know, Libra coin, is really interesting. I mean, I, I have a personal Facebook account, and I never really noticed the facebook marketplace where it's kind of like craigslist or uh you know ebay on facebook where you can buy items locally and you can pay them using something and they they want you to pay using a, a their own internal token so i think libra will take off someday at least something like it jp morgan very positive and again we're making baby steps in the right direction because we do live in a regulated world and these regulations need to be uh respected and addressed and solved because regulation is about process and procedures it isn't so much about success or failure. So we need to get this latest groundwork. And I think we're still building it in a positive direction. All right. There's a lot to still be unpacked here. These crypto markets still very nascent from pretty much every perspective you could think of in the, in the broad traditional financial sense. You mentioned the having coming up here, uh, Bill. This could certainly be a driver of the current price action we're seeing. You know, we saw it play out in Litecoin as you approach that having event. We saw a huge run up, and then Litecoin kind of gave some of that back. We'll get more into the altcoin in a little bit. Uh, of course, we are coming up on, perhaps, uh, the move that could be the bullish sign. A lot of people have been looking for out there in Bitcoin land, uh, the halving, which is expected if all things are held equal between now and the middle of the year, right around May 14th. Again, that's going to fluctuate based on the Bitcoin mining rate out there, but they expect it to happen on May 14th of this year when Bitcoin mines its 630,000th block. And that's, of course, when the rewards for mining get halved. And as a result, we see some interesting price action leading into that event. And now the question, of course, comes is coming out of that. We've seen a lot of names sell off pretty aggressively after the halving. So will we see something similar play out in Bitcoin? Or is this perhaps a, a move up to the next plateau in price action? We shall see. We shall also see what's going on from a ball and a term structure and all that skew, all that good stuff out here as well. Again, all this data coming to us, courtesy of our friends over there in SKEW land, S-K-E-W, not the old S-K-3-W. Yeah, that still works, but SKEW.com, S-K-E-W.com. They finally got the good URL over there. They ponied up for, for the good URL over there, so you too can check out all of this data for yourself. Check it out. It's still free over there, so check it out before they come to their senses uh, over there. Bitcoin vol right now, the 30-day realize, it's still around that 50-odd percent, about 52.5%. It's down from about 
this time last show. The implied also not really moving a heck of a lot since our last show. 30-day implied is down to about 57%. It was about nearly 60% on our last show. So it hasn't been a huge move from a vol perspective. Again, there's enough of a swing going on out there. It's frothy enough to keep us at these levels. It's going to be going to require a lot of stagnation or another big move to send us moving in, in either direction, up or down from a vol perspective. But it's frothy enough to keep us around this 50-odd percent level for a while. And that's kind of what we've seen for a little bit out here. Volume-wise, this hasn't been a rock'em, sock'em robots period over the past couple of weeks. Remember, we like to use that 30 million notional level as kind of our barometer for when a day is active or not. And it's only been a few days over the past couple of weeks where it's really – we've seen uh, Deribit, which is a platform we look at here, uh, Deribit really blowing through that. The biggest day was on the 2nd, so coming into the new year hot with 64 million contracts. The 5th also saw about 41 million contracts. We saw the first first day of the year doing about average paper, about 32 million contracts. Not a ton, not a little, just a little bit of – Average and on the 29th of December, they put up about 42 million contracts. So, a few highlight days in there, but no days really uh, threatening, you know, 100 plus million notional or anything along those lines. Looking at what's been trading over the past couple of weeks, it's fairly, uh, fairly recent stuff going up on the second, which was one of the more active days we saw out there. In fact, the most active day over the past couple of weeks. That's when we saw some interesting prints out here. In the Jan, uh, Jan downside puts, in particular, the Jan 6,500 puts, looks like someone was coming to play, buying 200 lots out there. First 200 of the Jan 6,500 puts, these are expiring at the end of Jan, the 31st, and then coming in to buy a few more, a few minutes later, 200 more to be precise. Uh, the same strike, 6,500 puts, but going a little bit closer to expiration, going in the expiring on the 17th. So... Loading up on that 6,500 put track. Maybe they've been reading some of those crypto patterns analysis out there and trying to line up their levels with that. Either way, it looks like some put buy-in. Uh, not that far out either. Just, just the end of Jan is kind of what's dominating the tape. Also saw 200, 200 was like the big print for the last couple of weeks. Nothing really much beyond that. 200 live, the 7,500 calls going up. So if you're not all about the downside, there was some upside as well. And actually a couple of 200 lots going up of the 7,500 calls on different Different days out there. Some of that coming yesterday, actually. 200 like on yesterday. So there was some upside. There was some downside. Maybe someone legging into a bit of a uh, a bit of a time strangle there. All those calls going up, expiring on the 31st. So they weren't playing with their expiration cycles on the call side like they were. With the put side, if it was indeed the same player. And we don't. We don't know that, obviously. Ball term structure looking pretty similar to how it was last show. The one-month skew. Pretty similar to what the average is. The average is right around a half a percent on the positive side, and we're pretty much right at that right now. So the skew out there looking pretty average. <laughs> the one-month skew, at least, is not telling us any big bid to the calls or big bid to the puts. So nothing really in the tea leaves of the skew right now that's, that's shaping up to show us, hey, we really need to, to pay attention out here. Call the put ratio ticking up a bit. We're seeing the calls taking the lead up to about two-thirds uh, they were it was actually exactly fifty percent, uh, so pretty much pick them calls and puts on our last show. Now it's up to about two thirds calls and about a third on the put side. Open interest uh, ticking down a bit. We saw a lot of paper come off the board at the end of December. December thirty first contracts was kind of where the lion's share of the OI was aggregated in Bitcoin options. So when December rolled off the board, a lot of the options went with them. The OI is down to about three hundred and fifteen million. From about 435 million on our last show, Ledger X also coming off. It was right around 40 million on our last show. Now down to about 29 million out there. If you're wondering where the new pockets of open interest are now, looks like it's all the way out to March. Uh, the March contract expiring on the 27th is where the largest next pocket of open interest. Not quite. Can't really, obviously can't make up for what went off in December, as you saw from the overall open interest numbers. But about 15,500 contracts. Seem to be the lining up in March. That's the biggest one. Number two would be the end of Jan, so the Jan 31st contract with about 10,200. And then we've got some, uh, looks like some weeklies expiring this week in Jan, expiring on the 10th with about 6,500 contracts. So that's kind of where the, the lion's share of the new paper, the remaining paper, is, is lining up out here. Let's turn our attention now to the futures. Overall, not a huge Volume week, even though a strong volume year, we touched on a little bit last year, or last year, it was last year, also last decade, also our last show, when we talked about some of the some of the highlights for Bitcoin futures on the year, ADV overall increasing 
by about 75% over the course of 2019. The big volume day was about 33,600 contracts. That was on May 13th of last year. So they set their high in the middle of the year, never really retraced that, but still had some strong volume through the rest of the year. The ADV is also up to about 63, almost 6,400 contracts uh, out there. Remember, that's a 5X coin, so pretty beefy. A decent a decent lead-in, a decent run-in to when we launch the options coming up, I believe, next week over there. That should be kind of interesting to watch. Right now, not a ton of paper, but a decent amount right around that ADV right now, actually. We're at about 5,700 in that front Jan contract and about 500 in the other contracts. So you're at about 6,200 or so contracts on the tape over there at CME Land right now. Let's turn our attention to backed, the back futures. Remember, check out that backed volume bot if you're into into the backed <laughs> updates. It's a fun little bot, and all it does is exactly what the name implies, just tweeting out some backed volume throughout the day. And so far today, according to the backed bot, we're seeing about, there's about 2,100 uh, Bitcoin, 2,100 contracts traded, which is one-to-one, so that's 2,100 Bitcoin as well. The target for today, this thing's a little bit shy of 3,000, so decent paper going up in backed land as well looking at their monthly summary for the futures as well seeing about a total volume of about 101 million and the max open interest is right around 4 million again this is all notional value now these are not contract size god forbid we give contracts <laughs> in uh, in crypto land that's just not the way things are done all right bill anything else you want to touch on looking back on the year anything else from bitcoin before we keep on rolling into altcoin sir um you know that's really that's really about it for Bitcoin, Mark. I just, again, think that the, the, the space is still very, very interesting. And to keep a long-term perspective uh, is certainly really positive. And, and, you know, what's going to happen with Bitcoin again in, in 2020 and beyond? Probably more of the same. I mean, stop and think about the fact that from basically 2010 to 2020, Bitcoin just it came on the scene. And look at what impact it's had just on the way we think of digital assets. And so, the next 10 years are going to be absolutely amazing, fun to be around. And I think that this is you and your show and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is you are on the forefront of, uh, you know, being someone to provide super important, you know, content and information. And this is this is the future. And, and we're here. It's now. It's, it's not down the road. And to be a part of that is really exciting. And you know what? You're right, Bill. It is all due to us, this tremendous growth of the crypto space. I, I will take your praise, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is, we are the architects of all crypto derivatives growth here in 2019. With that big head, let's keep on rolling right on into a little bit different universe, the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, welcome to the altcoin universe. I'm going to break down some fun things for you in the year that was altcoin here in a little bit. Looking at the levels right now and looking at some of the technicals from our friends of crypto patterns. Remember, they said on the show many times in the past. Bitcoin kind of takes up all of the oxygen in the room. So where Bitcoin goes, everything else tends to follow. Uh, so altcoin, their analysis kind of similar to what you're seeing in Bitcoin. Uh, obviously, you have to look at the volume to really kind of gauge that. A lot of these altcoin do a fraction of the volume, if even that, <laughs> that Bitcoin does. So it's kind of hard to show it. They said in the past, ETH, obviously one of the best correlations they've seen in terms of volume. Obviously, it's the number two marketplace out there as well. They mentioned in the past things like the Litecoin having as well. Uh, so they're saying right now, overall, altcoin still showing a strong correlation to Bitcoin. And all trades still need to be entered with this uh, longstanding trend in mind. They don't see any end to that trend anytime soon. Speaking of trends, following Bitcoin, this is a good one to be following right now because the altcoin Mostly, uh, pretty much all of the major ones in the green to start the year here as well. Coming into showtime, we're seeing ETH up nearly nearly 10 handles. For, actually, right now, it just ticked up again, so it is up over 10 handles. It was up 9.5 handles right before the show, and now it's up to just a little, about 10 and a quarter handles. We're at about 131 and a quarter last show, and we're closing in on 141 and a half right now, partway through the show up here. So a good good run here. For ETH over the end of last year, the beginning of this new, this exciting new year, and indeed this new decade. By the way, if you're wondering what happened in ETH over the course of the past year, an interesting year. We started the year not that far away from where we are right now. 137.73 is where we kicked off the year. 
end of the year about 128.72, so off about 12% on the year. Uh, the biggest move in ETH was about 139% over the course of the first six months. Again, that kind of tracks what happened out in Bitcoin as well. So the first half of the year, pretty strong, up about 140%. Second half of the year, not so much, obviously, given a lot of that back. Uh, the second half of 2019, over the first 10 days of July, I think following in the wake of a lot of that Libra fiasco, we saw ETH taking a drubbing as well, lost 36%. Over the course of the first 10 days of July, that was interesting one. Actually, looking here, yeah, interesting, 139% then actually dropping. June 26, we saw the peak for ETH, so right in the middle of the year. And then we kind of saw a lot of that a lot of that dropping off as a result. To end the year net down a little bit, down about 12%, even though we've gained most, if not all of that, back now to start the year. So an interesting year, kind of a net nothing year for ETH, even though in the interim, we had a lot of interesting spikes and volatility out there. Remember, go check out uh, – let's, let's pull it up really quickly here, our friends over there in Skewland, because they also have, of course, a little bit going on. In, and I know a lot of you guys like to look at the ETH options as well. So if you head on over there, when you're looking at the Bitcoin options and the Bitcoin futures, also click on the old ETH options so you could see some of the fun from yourself. Last time we chatted here, Realize Vol and E 30-Day Realize was at about 58%, and it's still pretty much a little bit north of that, about 64% right now. The At The Money Vol was about 75 76%, and it's pretty much a little bit shy of that right now, about 71.6%. The call to put had fallen off. It was all calls all the time, so it was about 91%. In favor of the calls out there in Bitcoin land, it had dropped to 55% as of our last show. And right now, it's pretty, still pretty close to that, about 59% in favor of the calls. So obviously, a lot of call OI came off the books. Also, some put OI got added, and that, that, combo, that combo worked in its favor. Let's see, overall open interest, we had dropped quite a bit on our last show. Actually, not a ton. About $41 million down to about $37 million. And right now, we have seen... OI dropping off a cliff. Again, that goes to what I was saying earlier in Bitcoin. Apparently also true in ETH as well. A lot of that OI was locked up in December. Now that December is off the board, we have fallen off quite a bit, down to about $17 million. So pretty much got cut in half, if not more, uh, over the course of the past couple of weeks as we saw DEES rolling off the board. Right now, looking at where the lion's share of the paper is, it's out in March as well in ETH with about, looks like about uh, 53 thousand contracts out in march land that's kind of number one with a bullet out there right now so we'll see if march over the course of the coming weeks so that can build up some more oi and that can match what dees had but so far uh, not so much let's move on to our other favorite here ripple what a year it was for xrp what the last couple of weeks it was as well also rallying here coming into showtime not quite at 22 cents about 21 Point nine. That puts it up about two cents from where it was on our last show. Looking at uh, the year that was in XRP, it pretty much ended the year off about 47%. So we know a lot of people had a lot of hopes for XRP over the course of 2019. And a lot of that not playing out. You know, there were legal issues. Uh, we're seeing some concerns now about dumping uh, the Ripple folks, they obviously are the largest owners of XRP, and there's some concerns that they're dumping it. They're pushing back against that, saying we're not dumping. That would hurt us with the largest owners. Why would we do that? But there's still there's a lot of a lot of sturm and drang going on right around XRP right now, but still managing to buck the trend and uh, and finish this past couple of weeks up for uh, not up for the year. Though and the biggest move we saw was downside, not nearly 30 percent in November. So 47% down for the year and 30% decrease in November alone. On December 2nd, the total transferred assets reached $1 billion. Uh, so that also was what led some folks to think that the Ripple folks were dumping XRP, was the, seeing that volume kind of spike up. And again, they're pushing back on that, but it still is a contentious issue. So it seems like, unfortunately, for all the XRP bulls out there, and we hear from you, we know you're out there, doesn't seem like the headwinds have gone away anytime soon uh litecoin let's see come at showtime up about five bucks from where it was on our last show it was about 39 and three quarters and it was about 44 and three quarters uh coming into showtime as well so an interesting run here for our litecoin and then bitcoin cash up about 40 handles 
coming into showtime here. Last show was about one ninety four eighty, and coming this show is about two thirty four half. So right around forty bucks here for that. We have some biggest gainers and losers. Before I get into that for the year, Bill, I know you like to hang your hat in the altcoin space. Whenever you come on, you always have some interesting and indeed esoteric altcoin up your sleeve, Bill. So what was catching your eye? What was resonating for you in the altcoin universe in 2019, Mr. Bill? Well, I, ha- I, th- I say with the uh, the greatest humility that a lot of the projects and tokens and uh, you know communities and people that I met uh, ultimately crashed and burned, okay, which is what you'd expect in a nascent technology. Uh, but again, we have to kind of brush that off and look forward to the future. You know, 2019, it was, uh, uh, again, we were kind of, uh, l- so we were still high, right? We still had a buzz from the rally from 2016 up until 2018 when we pretty much made our highs. And so we saw a lot of interesting uh, initial coin offerings. We saw great presentations. We saw people, you know, with the idea of great projects. And some of that was funded by the money that was raised during the initial coin offering. But unfortunately, most of that has died. And if you were someone who had a project that uh, collected Ethereum or collected, you know, money for your project, you were long only, like many of the hedge funds, right? There was a long only mentality where they didn't want to keep their money in U.S. dollars or w- wouldn't even dream of selling their Ethereum to pay for projects and give them any kind of longevity. So unfortunately, everything, pretty much everything I talked about uh, went out in a, in a, a, a ball of flame, so to speak. Um, but again, what we're seeing now, I think, for 2020, again, always liking to look forward is the fact that venture capital, private equity is getting more involved. And with that comes great management teams and vision that, you know, you can't even possibly imagine. So I think we're seeing a conversion from that space where uh, it was a lot of hype, initial coin offering, great projects. Maybe they did or did not have enough money to fund uh, or give them any longevity. Now venture capital moving in and quietly uh, working their way in this space and going to be able to take advantage of it. How are your friends over there in HXRO doing? We have them on the show. They're interesting. Of course, they are that gaming kind of utility token. Have you talked with them of late? You know, I, I haven't, Mark. Uh, I still love the platform. I love the way it looks. Uh, I like the way it plays. I love, still love the team. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but again, there's always, um, you know, every organization, every entrepreneur has, uh, you know, struggles, uh, you know, in the business model. And I, I don't want to comment on, you know, anything specifically. I haven't really looked at them or spoken with them or even followed them you know, on Twitter since probably our last conversation, you know, a month or two ago. I'm just saying that in general, you know, the vibe in Chicago, you know, Chicago is this epicenter of cryptocurrency conversation. And so when you hear things going on in Chicago, you know, they're happening elsewhere. So I don't mean HXRO specifically. I'm just saying, you know, globally, the big picture we've seen, you know, I, I see it in my own meetup group that meets in Glenview, the North Shore Bitcoin and Blockchain meetup group. You know, we had 40 people come to our event a year ago. Now we have eight people, and half of them are there just for the free pizza. So, again, the conversation is very, very different now. And, honestly, I think it's more authentic conversation, and it's people who really generally want to be there and want to stay in touch with the game. So um, I'm I'm excited about what's being built. Um, And, again, I think we have to begin again and look forward to what, what can be and what is going on today. In their defense, though, it is really, really good pizza, right? In their defense, it's really, really good pizza and good beer, yes. <laughs> oh, good beer, yes. Good beer as well. well. I'm checking out our friends HXRO while we're talking, and yeah, it looks like they've got some decent uh, 24-hour trading volume, over 7,000, the market cap over 2.5 million. So it's like there's, they're setting some new records out there. I always like to check in on, on the guests on the show, see how they're faring out there. Speaking of how things are faring out there in all coin land, we'll just throw some, some fun nuggets of info at you. Most of these obviously are not optionable. Most of these don't even really trade with any volume, let alone any real value to them. Yet, they're some of the biggest movers, gainers, and losers in the altcoin universe in 2019. The biggest upside player, LunaCoin. That's L-U-N-A. Uh, year-to-date, up 25,000%. The biggest move was nearly 50,000% in a single day. This was on August 19th. Uh, they say the, the chart looks like the cardiogram of a patient who woke up from a coma. I can certainly concur with that. Uh, They said that big spike on August 19th was absurdly short-lived because it collapsed uh, the next day. You still had a good year. Uh, Since the beginning of the year, it rose from 0.001 cents all the way up to about a quarter of a cent, 0.25. So interesting year for them. Uh, Bitcoin with two I's, a.k.a. B2G. That's kind of a bit of a fork of Bitcoin, if you're following along out there, they had a, a not a great year, down 99%. You know, their biggest move 
came in uh, in February, surging from 0.02 cents to 0.7 cents. Uh, so uh, a big move uh, over the course of a week, 3,500 uh, percent since July, though. Again, with a lot of these names, once the great culling came in July, a lot of these haven't fared as well. Seal, S-E-E-L-E, maybe Sealy, up 2,640 percent year uh, over the course of the last year. It's currently valued at 0.137. See why I'm saying a lot of these are not optional. They're not even trading in full units of value, listeners out there. Uh, let's see some other ones you may have heard of. Oh, Matic, M-A-T-I-C. Uh, they had a year-to-date up 285%. Biggest move for them was 1,233% over the course of a single month. That was in May. And they had a 52% price drop over a week, not, not too long after that, to kind of come back. Back to reality there. That was listed initially at 0.003 cents. <laughs> yeah, some of these values are pretty good. Chain link, ticker is link, L-I-N-K, up 459%. Biggest move was 1,186% over the course of six months. So again, these these are some moving moving frames of reference here. Binance coin, a coin we talked about before on the show, you guys have heard of. This one was year-to-date up 122%. The biggest move, 548% to the upside over the course of six months. This is obviously a utility token for a discounted trading fees on the Binance exchange. I use exchange in quotes because that's kind of a bit of a moving target in the crypto world. Uh, but that platform's popularity drove drove the value of this coin up 548% over the course of the first half of the year. And again, finished a year up, which a lot of these altcoin did not. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the, since December of last year, the price has grown uh, to 3848, so that's uh, again a pretty, pretty, pretty decent move out there. Let's just see if we can find some others. Some big losers to the downside. We mentioned one already. BitTorrent also not looking good, down 99 percent. Biggest move is down 97 percent over a single day. So it looks like a lot of that loss. Uh, this is Tron's BitTorrent. Uh, that a lot of that loss came on May 1st. Uh, so not a good day for them. Uh, Bitcoin Gold down 59%. Omnitude, I just like the name, ticker symbol Ecom. That's down 85%, 80% over the year and down 65% over two months. Uh, ETH, we already talked about the biggest move for ETH was down 36% in 10 days. That was a sharp price reversal down in the early days of July. After all, that madness unfolded out there in the land of, of everything crypto after in the wake of of all things Libra and the uh, the congressional shellacking, shall we say, for lack of a better better term. All right, let's keep on rolling. I want to make sure we get some of you guys on the show here as well to cap off the year with a little bit of your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody, welcome to the Crypto Questions. And before we get to said questions, I want to actually get to one from you, Bill. I know this is one that's kind of been uh, been floating around your brain of late. You mentioned kind of the regulatory side a lot. I know you, you tweeted out something to this effect not too long ago, a week or so ago, about the Blockchain Technology Act and perhaps uh, some lingering concerns you may have over the impact of that. You want to share those concerns with our audience or maybe start by explaining what you're talking, what is that act, and then why does it have you perhaps a little concerned? Well, you know, Mark, as always, you know, we have to be, you know, I, I'm not an attorney, so I can't speak specifically on, uh, from, from a legal perspective on this particular act. But what we're, what we're seeing, again, if, if you want to follow cryptocurrency, you have to follow, you have to be in it on Twitter. And we have um, we have many wonderful things happening in Montana. We have some restrictions in, you know, in, in New York. And in, and, and in Illinois, we're seeing, on, again, we had this yin and yang, this, this tug of war uh, between the regulators and the entrepreneurs. And so, again, we see the act that prohibits local government from playing, uh, placing restrictions uh, or taxes on blockchain usage. We want to be able to make sure that we have a sandbox where we can uh, entrepreneurs are, are free to create tokens, free to create technology, free to create businesses. But at the same time, they have to be very compliant in terms of um, making sure that they follow, you know, the anti-money money laundering rules and the know your client rules and make sure that nothing nefarious can happen with these particular projects. So, again, I just see it as one more step in the right direction 
as far as regulators and entrepreneurs, regulators and cryptocurrency people uh, being able to have a con- sit in the same room and have a conversation. So I, I see, I see again, regulation, I don't see it as a bad thing. I see it kind of as a good thing, and we need it in order to move forward. There's nothing worse than a fearful entrepreneur, especially in the cryptocurrency space, because the ramifications and the brand recognition uh, it can, can devastate a, a project or a company. So again, we're, we're seeing more and more uh, interesting conversation from the regulators, more and more clarity, and we just really, really need that. Good stuff here lurking. And if you're concerned about this, give Bill a follow over there on the old Twitters at Senecal Capital, C-E-N-A-C-L-E Capital. He tweets about that and a lot of other fun stuff. Let's see what you guys have on your crypto brains here to start the year. First up, from the creatively named Jeff. Jeff wants to know, any particular thoughts on the potential for CME Bitcoin options and backed Bitcoin options? Well, the backed options are obviously already launched I've been having a heck of a time getting concrete volume data on those and transaction data, which is usually not a good sign that they're blowing the doors off. But I don't think anyone really expected them to blow the doors off. I think a lot of people were surprised that BAC was launching the option as quickly as it was when the futures had really yet to establish themselves. Like I just mentioned, they're, they're doing a few thousand contracts a day, which is decent, but it's a one-to-one coin, so it's a smaller contract. Uh, so the the Bitcoin futures over there haven't really established themselves, so it doesn't surprise me that the options have yet to as well. And the backbot doesn't even tweet it out yet, so no, no one's really got a good handle as far as I can see on how many backed options are trading, which to me is usually shorthand for not a lot. But again, a new year, a lot can happen in this space. We want all these products to really resonate with you guys because that's more for us to talk about and crunch the numbers on and analyze here on a program like this. The CME options are coming up pretty soon. I think by the, not quite by, let's see, is it was going to be on by our next, yeah, it should be by the time we gather here together again next week. I do believe we should have CME Bitcoin Options Live. It sounds so crazy to say that. I've been asking for these things for over two years now to finally have them in our hot little hands soon. It seems almost too much to believe. So we'll see how that impacts the futures volume. We'll see how that, all you guys have been asking you know, how is the skew going to shape up? I have to imagine it's going to look a lot like what we're seeing now. These other platforms out there like Deribit and others, these things are not going to trade in a vacuum. If you're playing on one platform, you're going to probably bring some of that to the other platform. So I don't imagine they're going to exhibit some absurd esoteric skew that we're not seeing anywhere else. That's not usually how these things go. Uh, but that is the kind of volume leader. That's the big dog right now in terms of a listed Bitcoin future. So I would expect a, a fairly robust uptake on the options, maybe not right away, but uh, over time as things start kicking off. And that, of course, should accrete back into more futures volume and vice versa. It's kind of a bit of a virtuous circle there, each of those kind of lifting the other as they keep going. So hopefully, I'm pretty optimistic on, on, the, on the future, pun intended, of these options, particularly on the CME side. I've yet to see any real data out of back, but you know, we're hoping those things can uh, take off as well. This is a bit of a frequent talking point we have here on the show, Bill. People like to write in and ask about... <laughs> Our thoughts on the on the prospects for these. Are you excited that we're going to see real lit listed Bitcoin options for pretty much the first time here in coming up in 2020, Bill? Yes, yes, yes. Um, again, as a state registered investment advisor, I, I am just waiting, waiting patiently uh, on the cryptocurrency type exchange traded fund and listed options. Uh, I, you know, do I do I have a ton of interest from my current clients? Eh, no, not really. But again, like you and I are trying to skate ahead to where the puck might be, and to be able to have these retail products. I mean, you can log into your Fidelity account and add a third party uh, wallet, like a cryptocurrency wallet, at Coinbase. And so, in the very near future, you're going to be able to buy and sell cryptocurrencies just by logging into your Fidelity or your TD or your other, um, you know, IRA or 401k. I think that's super exciting. And to be able to make that connection, you know, we're seeing emerging very slowly, but we're seeing emerging between traditional asset management and cryptocurrency as an asset. And soon it will be done on one platform, and we're just kind of waiting for the ultimate user experience and client experience to make it easy. So, yes, I'm super excited. It's, it, it's all steam, you know, full steam ahead at the rate that we need to go in order to comply with regulatory and, you know, know your client and AML type of uh, – issues as well as custody. And there's a lot of kinks that need to be worked out. It's a super complex model. But I am very encouraged and very excited about how the future is going to look. And, and, I, and I, nothing's going to change my mind. 
Yeah, a guy like you, this has to be great because these are products you can finally sink your teeth into. You can't really go VPNing, tunneling into a dare bit with your client assets. It's not really how the game is played. So, yeah, a product like this opens the door for players like you to start really trading these things with some decent size and decent action. So it certainly should be. So it sounds like, uh, Jeff, we're all in agreement here. We're, we're pretty optimistic. More products is always a good thing. And then we'll see how these shake up. But I think we're pretty optimistic, particularly for the CME ones. We'll wait and see on the back ones. Hopefully those perform well as well. All right. Azaz. Azaz wants to know, what is, what is options skew telling us about Bitcoin right now? Well, I kind of mentioned at the top of the show, not a heck of a lot, unfortunately. It's kind of right about exactly average, which is about half of a percent in the positive direction. That's pretty much exactly where the skew is right now. So... Not a lot of bias in one direction or the other right now. Maybe playing a little bit of a wait and see. A lot of OI came off the board as well, so it's kind of hard to read into the tea leaves of what's left. We'll have to see kind of what gets reestablished out there, what can become the new Ds out there in terms of the mecca for all the OI. And once that gets reestablished, maybe we'll have a firmer sense of what's going on right now. Things are kind of seemingly average, and obviously the Bulls have the lead right now because we're in rally ho mode. We'll see if that stays over the course of the rest of the week, but for now... Kind of average. All right, and let's end. Let's end on a fun, positive note here, Bill. Because why not? It's a new year, new decade, all sorts of fun stuff in store for us here on the network and indeed on the program. If you guys out there at home listening, this comment comes from a a Laddle. A Laddle says, "Thanks for making this show." Well, you're welcome, a Laddle. Are they going to write? You guys are great. <laughs> Loving crypto and the network overall. Not an options guy, but you are luring me to the dark side. Happy 2020. Well, thank you. For listening, A. Lally, we've been hearing a lot of stories like yours. Obviously, we have a pretty broad reach in the option space, but we welcome folks like you as well who are discovering this show. You're coming at it from a more of a crypto perspective, and then you're hearing about these options things, and you're starting to dip your toes into some of our other programs. So it's been fun to watch the growth kind of going in the opposite direction, coming from a new show and then filtering in to all the other programs we have on there. So all you folks out there like A. Lally, we welcome all of you. Uh, thanks for making 2019 a great year, and thanks for the love, and we we'll are look forward to having an even more fun year in store for you here on the Crypto Rundown and indeed on the network in 2020. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we have come to the end of another exciting sojourn through the world of all things crypto. What a year it was, 2019, some highs, some lows, some middles, all sorts of fun stuff. To be found over there. But before we go, let me go back around the horn. Let me check in with my cohort here, helping me kick off this new year and this new decade, Mr. Bill Ulaveri. Bill, if folks are intrigued, they want to reach out to you. Maybe they have a question about crypto. Maybe they want to talk some money management. Maybe they want to trade crypto here around Chicago. Uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, well, always, you can contact me through our website at SenecalCapital.com. That's C E N A C L E, SenecalCapital.com. Or call our office at area code 847-686-4800 or connect with me on, on Twitter uh, or LinkedIn. Uh, both of those are ways that people can contact me with a direct message. All right. Check them out at Cynical Capital, C-E-N-A-C-L-E, on the Twitters, or again, Bill Ulaveri on LinkedIn and all that. I'll even spell that for you to be nice. It's U-L-I-V-I-E-R-I. I don't know if Italians on the network. I had to bring in more. <laughs> so check them out over there in between our episodes. And on behalf of Mr. Bill and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing for making 2019 such a great year for this program. It was our inaugural year. We loved it. We loved bringing it to you. Love that you guys loved it so much, like A. Laddle and the rest of you out there. Our, all that love is brought back right to you guys. We love having you guys listen, send in questions, all the fun stuff that you do. Keep it coming, and we'll see you back here next week and indeed more of 2020 for more of the Crypto Rundown. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options 